Welcome to Art and Scroll Studio, where every episode we celebrate a unique artist in presentation and conversation. On January 18th, 2023, Lori Wall was our special guest. Please subscribe to our channel so you can be sure to know when we have events coming in the future or watch episodes that have happened in the past. What follows is Lori's full episode as it appeared on January 18th. When I think of Lori's work, having worked with her over this past while, getting to know her and getting to know her work, I am reminded of a piece of music that has layers upon layers of melodies and textures. Her work combines so many elements that interweave to form a complex whole, which is ironic because she begins unweaving, but in effect, at the end, her attention to detail is more than the visual elements. It's the script, the text, the intention that creates the final melody. Welcome, Lori. How did I do? Oh, you're amazing, Shelley. <laughs> Thank you. You are a wonderful, <laughs> wonderful interpreter of my work. Thank you for saying that. But first, we have to get down to really what happened. Tell us, did you want to be an artist when you were young? It was probably pretty far from my mind. Um, if I had a fantasy, it was being a pianist. Uh, mainly because I thought I could wear a long blue dress and that, that would be really nice. Um, no, it was far from my mind. <laughs> so in, in, instead, you grew up, what did you become when you grew up? What did I become? <laughs> that is a loaded question. That is a loaded question. Be, and you're still becoming. But before that, when you were young. Uh, when I was younger. I studied music and political science and went to law school and became a lawyer. Um, and um, how weird was that? <laughs> I kind of I, I kind of goaded you into saying that because I yes, want people to know <laughs> that because in your work, I'm, I'm convinced that there's some essence of orderliness. And I know that you come at things in a very um, a manner that is sort of linear in some cases. So I think it maybe plays into that in some way, but let's talk more about how, what about your Judaic influences? Where would you say those came from? Oh, it's just, it's our family. My uh, mother's father, my maternal grandfather was, uh, was an Orthodox rabbi. Um, I was very close to him and um, used to go to show with him on Shabbat morning when we were in the same city. Um, but it was just always our life. Um, my mother was raised Orthodox. My brother and I were raised in a reform synagogue actually. Um, and that was very startling to my mother didn't like the conservative rabbi. So we went to the reform synagogue in the temple. And she, the first time we went, the organ was played on Shabbat evening and she nearly passed out. And, <laughs> but um, it was a very eclectic upbringing. Um, in, in the sense that we had many, many non-Jewish friends. We, uh, I grew up in San Diego and the Jewish community was extremely small there. And um, so we grew up with everybody, basically. It was always a part of your life. It was a thread that was always was, there. Yeah, we always, we always celebrated Shabbat and, you know, all the time. I mean, you know, it, that wasn't a, a sometime thing. So I do that in my own home too. It's good to know that backdrop against which you started to develop your own spiritual work. And I want to ask you something before we embark on our journey of looking at the work. A lot of your work falls under the category of projects. And we're going to look at that. We're going to see the Psalms project and the Shabbat project. But I want to ask you this question. Do you embark on a project knowing you're going to do a Shabbat project? Or do you begin the work and then say, hey, I think this could be a Shabbat project. It varies a lot. Um, early on, I started working on a series of pieces called Ancient Messages. Um, and that was fairly intentional. I'd be, been reading a lot of uh, spiritual texts and those were sort of the ancient messages I was thinking about. But some projects like uh, Birds of Longing developed uh, from... We'll, we'll discuss that. The Shabbat project developed all at once. So it varies a lot. It really okay, depends. Well, as we go through, you can reflect on that and we can talk about it again. But it always is 
makes me curious as to how a body of work begins and how you know when it's over. So let's go to the share screen and make sure we can all see what we're gonna see. Can you see it, Lori? Can you see my share? Yes. Great. Okay, let's begin. So we're gonna go back in time to some of your earliest uh, efforts to when you really started to work on uh, doing the pieces, the unweavings. Tell me a bit about your time in South Africa. Yeah, this time in South Africa was preceded by um, a year in Kenya when I became very aware of uh, apartheid in, in South Africa, um, especially because a lot of people from the Afri Af African National Congress were in exile and had, were, were living in Kenya. So I became very aware of what was going on in South Africa. And when um, Nelson Mandela was released from prison, I wanted to bear witness to that experience of, um, you know, uh, redemption really, what, what was occurring in society. And I was fortunate enough to get a fellowship at the uh, Forsberg Artist Studios in at, at Johannesburg. And um, I did several pieces there to celebrate the end of apartheid and bear witness to what was happening. Garment of Songs takes this joyous text um, about all the women's went out with timbrels and danced. And this was the joy of this, sing a new song. This is a new era in- uh, sorry, I'm sorry, that was on the previous slide and I, I was just uh, moving forward, but- Absolutely, we're going to see a lot of text. Tell us, Lori, the text that we're going to see is that's what is that what we're looking at in the piece? Um, all the the pieces that we'll be looking at do have text. Uh, in this piece, it's very integrated in terms of color within the piece, so you can't really see it distinctly. So much later work um, emphasizes the text much more by uh, the way I use color. So I'm going to show this. Was this a piece done at that time in South Africa? Yes, and um, Tree of Light, the Messiah tree. I mean, you know, the Messiah had really arrived. <laughs> this was, it was amazing. And it was amazing for me to be in South Africa at that time. Um, people there were very forgiving of the people who had been oppressing them. And I was amazed at the generosity of people there. It was truly extraordinary. I believe you shared with me when we were talking about some of the influences that you felt from working with some of the artists that it sort of, you, you had mentioned to me that it opened your mind because they would use anything in terms of the, how they would approach art. Yeah, well, it was just, I mean, it was because they had no resources basically. So they would paint on anything. Um, newspaper would become a background. Canvas was too expensive for people to buy, for the artists to buy. For instance, um, they use hardware store paint, not Liquitex paint. Um, it was it was very very interesting to see that. Um, when I was teaching in Soweto, I brought some canvas for the students to unweave, and it was the first time they had been able to work with canvas, and it was very exciting for them. It was you know a new experience. Was it, uh, did it, did it give you a sense of liberation as well in terms of, and a sense of reinforcement of the idea? Cause you were doing something very unusual. Um, yeah, although I had started unweaving and collage really long before that, but it was, it was more just, it was very, very interesting to me to see what artists can do with very little. And it, it's, it's inspiring. It's very inspiring, you know, and, uh, you realize what freedom you can have, basically. I also should say I'm totally untutored in art. I, my last art lesson was in eighth grade when my uh, we were supposed to do landscapes or seascapes and the teacher looked at my sea, seascape and said, your banks are going in the wrong direction. I said, okay, that's the end of it. That was, um, that was why I never considered art as a career. <laughs> I'm, sure, I'm sure she's sorry now. Yeah, <laughs> but I, I do feel that perhaps some of that freedom that you saw there seeped uh, had a way of giving you confirmation 
Oh, I'm, I'm sure it did, but it, it also reinforced the work that I wanted to do in terms of art as an instrument of uh, social protest or drawing attention to so social issues and doing it in a way that inter integrates faith and social issues and, and art. And one of the things I was very aware of in South Africa was how artists had used art as a way of social protest and also as a way of reinforcing a sense of community and spiritual uh, community. So that, that was totally inspiring. So this is a piece that in fact ended up in a place of justice. Tell the story here. Yeah, this was, this was very special. Um, Albie Sachs, who is on the uh, Constitutional Court in South Africa, was visiting the University of Chicago where my husband was teaching law. And Albie came over to my studio. He was, he's very interested in art in general and he wanted to see what I was doing. And he saw this piece and it's, who shall ascend the mountain of the Lord? Who shall dwell in his holy place? And it grabbed him. The, the new constitutional court building is on a hill, which was the site of an apartheid era prison. And so the idea here was that we are sending the mountain to a place of justice that was originally a place of injustice. So he asked me if I would uh, contribute this to the court, which, which of course I did. <laughs> And it's a very beautiful sentiment and it's so well expressed in this piece in the way that you have, um, the way it looks like it has wings that in a way it's flying with freedom. And I think that's, this piece is really expressive of that. So now let's talk about where do you get your ideas from? I always like to know what influences an artist. Talk to me a bit about some of these influences on your work. Oh, I think um, I've always been interested in looking, you know, looking at art. We started when I was very young. We lived in Washington to see my parents took me to the National Gallery. They called it the Mellon Gallery. I thought it was called the Mellon Gallery because it was pink. Um, <laughs> so, uh, and um, I always had uh, Renoir's uh, The Little Girl with the Watering Can. Uh, a print of that in my room. And that was sort of a talisman, but uh, Paul Clay's work appealed to me a lot, especially because of the sort of uh, language that he uses there uh, is very appealing. Miro for the playfulness and his abstract figures. And Matisse, of course, for beauty, but also, um, well, mainly the beauty and the spiritual aspects. I went to the chapel of the rosary in Bons and in Judaism, you don't often fall on your knees, but if I could have, I would have. We were alone in the chapel. It wasn't a regular visiting day. And that was the instinct. The light was so beautiful. The colors were amazing. And these are the things I'm trying to convey in my own work, a sense of spirit and beauty and the texts that can talk to us that way. And I think there's also a, a commonality with the, the sort of rhythm that is created here. And a lot of your work does have that rhythmic quality in a sense that sort of musical uh, the, in the repetition here and in the detail here. Yeah. So, because I can see references to all those artists in your work. Talk to me about On Wings of Prayer. Yeah, this was a body of work that I, this is one that grew. It wasn't something that I started out thinking, I'm going to do a project on Wings of Prayer. I started doing one piece and another piece and another piece. And then I decided it would, I would like to exhibit them. And I thought, well, what is the, you know, theme of this? And it was on Wings of Prayer is what I, what I thought of. And this has traveled around substantially, especially to a lot of, um, churches and uh, theological seminaries, actually. Um, there's a strength of angels. Uh, he will give his angels charge over thee uh, to keep thee in all thy ways. This was a text that was read by Rabin's granddaughter at his funeral after his assassination. And it just grabbed me. I thought that was so beautiful and so heartfelt. 
that she saw them accompanying him. And this is a text that I've used several times, including in one of my church projects. Um, and it almost has a, a sense of heavens above the firmament here. I don't know if that's intentional, but it does seem- Yeah, the shelter, the shelter form. It's beautiful. Yeah. And sanctuary was, you know, it was just an, it was uh, an interpretation of the Exodus text. Um, Let the go the sanctuary that I may dwell among you. Peace like a river. Uh, one thing I wanted to point out here was that both the strips going down and the unweaving growing across are water references, basically water flowing down, water flowing across. And, um, this text from Isaiah was just very inspiring for me for that. What is the nature of this piece? It looks like it's hanging. It's hanging, but it's suspended on an armature which sticks out from the wall at its deepest point about seven inches. Um, so it's very sculptural as well. So the piece go, you know, moves in and out. It flows that way also, just in was the it, structure of it. Was it created for an architectural space or did you craft this you make the decision that it should be three-dimensional in that no, way i was really interested in getting off the wall a little bit um, <laughs> in a good way not a bad way yeah. um, and uh that was that was why one of my I've, I've also done circular forms and other other uh kinds of armatures so i think this is a good point to transition into the question that people might have which is how how do you what are these various elements that are comprising these art pieces? And I want to point out to people before we go to the next slide, you can see Lori's iconography in here. You can see these little figures. This is a whole language that she has developed. I'm going to show you. And then you can see the beads that are integrated as well as the Hebrew words that are here. So first of all, Lori developed her own language. What inspired you to do that? Um, it, I was inspired to do that because I can't do representational, representational art. I wanted to tell stories, but it wasn't going to be, if I tried to draw a person, it wasn't going to look very good. So I decided I would make up my own figures uh, to deal with it in my own way. And um, some of the figures um, came from a dance project that I was involved in watching the dancers uh, and their positions. So, so some of the figures that I have added in uh, have been from other experiences, but the first figures were basically to bear witness to what had gone on in South Africa. Those were the, those were the very first ones actually to tell that story. Because I want people to notice when they're looking at your pieces that all of these, in, these lines have meaning. These aren't just little squiggles. They are actually are uh, it, it, it's purposeful. And then another element that you use are, are the beads. Talk to me about the beads. Where do you, are, are they, how do you source them? How are you attracted to them? Yeah, the beads are another way of adding color and texture. I'm very interested in different kinds of textures. So obviously unweaving the threads is one kind of texture. Collage papers is another beads or another and beads have the different shapes forms colors textures and it's wonderful to work with them um, i started out working with beads that were from africa actually and were sand cast and very subdued and gradually got into many more colorful and shiny uh, beads i use a lot of bird beads in my work that's probably a signature element uh, as it is in my iconography as well and I get beads, um, when we lived in Chicago, I used to be able to get a lot in the stores there, but oddly enough in New York, it was more difficult. So I get them on the internet, I get them from Etsy, get them from all over the place. And of course, if I travel, I try to get them there as well. And friends bring so beads or sand from beaches that they've gone to, to incorporate. So a lot of different things. It's so, again, it gives you that sense of rhythm because your eye is drawn to them as they sort of are, are sprinkled across the texture of the unweaving. And it does emphasize almost a staccato-like feeling. In this particular piece, there's three languages at the bottom. Right, These, we have uh, 
Greek, Arabic, and Hebrew. This is a piece called Jerusalem. Very beautiful. And you can see the domes here. Would that be correct? Yes, yes. So now let's talk really, let's get down to it. How do we really do this thing? Oh, and I know we're, we're just going to talk for a minute about once upon a time, you decided to make a slit. Right. And, uh, once upon a time, I got really bored with stretch, uh, working on stretch canvas. And I took the canvas off the wall and tacked it to the wall, took it off the stretchers, tacked it to the wall. And then I decided, well, that still wasn't, didn't have enough for me. And I slid into it and started pulling threads. And um, as they say, the rest is history. I, it's, it's a wonderful form for me. I can do all sorts of shapes with it is what I, you know, what I discovered. Um, and it enables me to use the canvas uh, making a form in itself. So it's a lot more sculptural than just taking the canvas as uh, a surface, really. And now when I look at these figures, at first I thought this was embossing, but in fact it is not. Tell me about how you create your the shapes. Right, I first uh, draw them in pencil and then I mix up an acrylic paste, modeling paste to a consistency that's good to work with. And I take a very small, very fine brush and drip the modeling paste to uh, outline the letters. It's very painstaking. It's not good to make a mistake because it will stain the canvas and show. So it's, uh, it's quite a process, but I, the whole process of what I do, both the unweaving and putting the calligraphy on like this uh, and the painting and the beads, it's all a wonderful sort of meditative process for me. And the painting that we see at the top here, the painting, that's not the, painting, that's collage papers. Okay. So I go to wonderful uh, paper source and many other uh, places to get beautiful sheets of paper. And they say, are you going to make a book? And I said, no, I'm going to tear it up and <laughs> use it as a collage. And they're appalled. But it, I, and it's another way of adding color and texture and form. And the reason I'm pointing it out is because we go to the next side. So this is Nila. This is the process. And here's the finished piece. And I want people to see that that collage part, I believe is here. Is that correct, right. Lori? That's correct. So just to get a feel for how the whole thing comes together, it's a multi-layered process and right. takes, how much time would you say it would take you to make a piece like this? Like this, this size is, is rather large. It takes about three months. Wow. And um, I wanted to say the bees are also, um, I think of them as prayers and as marking points. So they're, they're to arrest your attention and to draw you in. They're not just for decoration, but they're to catch, to catch you, really. That's excellent. It tells you to be present right. and be mindful and to keep you there. So now we come to Ezekiel. Tell us, this one is, is really powerful. You can see the words in here. You can see bones. And, you know, it's got a lot of powerful words coming out. Talk to me about how you made this piece. Well, yeah, this was, uh, we were living in New York. We started living in New York in uh, 2001. And um, that was when September 11th happened is an extremely, obviously an extremely intense experience. And um, it took me a lot of years to sort of understand what I, what I wanted to express about that experience. Um, and Ezekiel was the piece I did. Um, it's a story about desolation and then redemption. Uh, because after the phrase of the bones being dry, um, there's the phrase, but God breathed life into the bones and said, these bones will live. So it's about suffering and redemption, basically. And um, the more subdued colors here are because of September 11th. I realized also that the form of the unweaving here, the architectural aspect, really was um, an allusion to the Twin Towers, which I did not do intentionally, but when I stood back from it at the end, I thought, 
Yeah, you uh, can see. Mm -hmm. You can see them. Yeah. Well yeah. done, Lori. And um, so that was that was sort of interesting. And then I thought, how can I? This was at a time where Islamophobia was very strong, um, right after September 11th, and I had been doing a lot of uh, interfaith projects, and I wondered how I could integrate. Judaism and Christianity and Islam. So I decided that I would um, go back to the period of the Convivencia in Spain, the Middle Ages period when the three religions, the three Abrahamic religions um, coexisted primarily, although not always, um, they coexisted peacefully and influenced each other architecturally and culturally and linguistically. So I was able to get a couple of grants and I went to do some research in Spain. I wanted to see it firsthand, these amazing buildings that had all this calligraphy and all this incredible design and color. And so this was, these are just a few pieces. The, um, one of the pieces at the top right, that's inside the uh, mesquita and it's the mirror of the prayer, prayer niche where you, where you orient yourself to prayer there. And it's full of these beautiful poems and calligraphy. It's just, it's an extraordinary place. So this was the genesis of this. This was the genesis of Birds of Longing, Exile and Memory, because I basically gave myself a course in Middle Eastern poetry and spiritual texts from the time of the Convivencia and relating it to contemporary Middle Eastern poetry because I was very caught up in what was happening in the Middle East also now, still. Uh, and um, and the, the themes, there were so many common themes of spiritual love and exile and longing and just, and memory and all this poetry was just amazing. So that was the beginning of Birds of Longing, which is 18, pieces and I could have kept going because the poetry was still there but I thought 18 was probably enough and also it's a good number in Judaism so good place to stop. This is one of uh, the last pieces I did in the series. Well there yet come the struggle of destinies. Um, I'm using the shapes there, the archways and the colors that were so dominant in the architecture. Uh, in Spain at that time. And I've got the text there from an Iraqi poet and from Yehuda Amakai. I love this quote. It's so relevant to today. And I, I just want to ask you a question. What, what is the scale of this piece? If you could just share, just, I don't need exact dimensions, but roughly. Yeah. It's about, um, let me see about 30 inches wide by maybe uh, four feet, five feet, something like that. It's pretty big. It's a large piece. Yeah. And it's incredible how you got the Arabic in there because I know you're familiar with Hebrew. Um, right. The Hebrew uh, calligraphy I use is based on a book of uh, learning Hebrew that, my grand that I studied with my grandfather. And I've kept that book all these years. And that was um, the basis for the Hebrew calligraphy. The, um, I hired native uh, speakers of Arabic and Hebrew for my project, uh, not only because I wanted word for word translations of the poems that I was using, um, but I also um, wanted sound with the project and uh, in combination with Daniel Wool, um, who is now a, a very um, eminent modern composer, I was able to catch him before he got very famous and afford him. And we did a soundscape uh, for the project. And there is sound and text for, and it's read in English, Arabic, and Hebrew um, with a background of music uh, by Maya Beiser. Yeah, that's the unfortunate part of and the limitation of this platform is we can't hear the music. Mm -hmm. Couldn't even hear it at the intro part. So unfortunately, we just have to hope one day to be present at this an exhibition of this nature. So this is another piece from that series. Right. I can right. see the influence of those arches here. 
Right, and it was um, that the text, when I'm unweaving, I'm trying to do a form that relates to the, the poetry that I've chosen so that they interact well. And so this was the window, the windows of prayer. And so Rabia, the I just want to mention Rabia al Adawiya was from the eighth century and she was actually a renowned woman poet at that time. So that was pretty unusual. And this has uh, text from the Quran in it as well. So the question is, I think I know the answer, but do you start with the title and then dive into looking for source material and then get inspired to do the art? Or do you start making, start reading first and then dive into it? This project was very much, I read for about a year and a half after I made Ezekiel. Then I had a year and a half of reading poetry and spiritual texts. And then I then I discovered the commonality of the various themes. And then I sort of put them together and thought, well, what kind of piece would go with this grouping of poetry and what would go with another grouping of poetry? And that's how it evolved. So it was very much evolved from expressing the text, studying the text first. Text comes first. In this, yes. So this is an interesting piece because it speaks to water. Talk to me about the, the is, is this meant to be a, a, an evocative? Yeah, this a, yeah, a stream of a winding, <laughs> a meandering stream, right. But this is, um, there are some very sad texts on here about um, weeping at the shores of loss. And also, you know, reminiscent of uh, by the waters of Babylon, um, mm -hmm. those various various texts there. So here is a piece that is about mourning and loneliness. It seems to me, the campsites are mute, and in yeah. fact, this is an interesting piece for you because it's asymmetrical. A lot of your pieces have symmetry. Right. What, was, what were you thinking here? Was that purposeful in terms of the message? Um, probably afterwards. <laughs> uh, it was just the form that, that came to me. Um, and, you know, afterwards I can say, oh, well, you know, they had to pack up their tents. They were wandering. So not everything was, you know, put together uh, that well. This was just the form that, that came to me as expressive of what was going on. And um, what was interesting to me is that this uh, poet writing in Arabic and poet writing in Hebrew a century apart are talking in the exact same way about this internal exile that they were experiencing in Spain in those years. And of course now it's very relevant to what's happening with refugees and immigrants. So we saw Jerusalem before, and this gives you the text. There's three views of Jerusalem, basically. And this is a, a piece that is, was this with, within the project? Was this an early piece? I see, again, the rhythm of the water running yeah. through. Yeah, the, let justice roll down like waters, right? So again, the vertical and the horizontal there with the form. This was a later piece. This was one of the last three pieces. And here's a detail from it. And you can see all the intricacy in it. Would you say, Lori, that, that three months to create a piece is, is pretty typical? Yeah, two and a half to three months for the scale that these pieces were, yes. I want to ask you one more question about your process. Do you sketch these out first? Do you draw these and know where you're going with it? Or is it really a kind of a symbiotic thing? You start tearing or you start unweaving and then you see where it goes. Well, um, in the beginning, I was totally, everything was sketched out. Um, all the calligraphy, the whole, the whole thing. It was, I couldn't, looking back, I can't believe that I did that. Um, <laughs> now it's more, I will, sketch the form of it what the part I'm going to unweave you know versus the other so that I get the rhythm of the unwoven places and the solid places 
And then after that, I figure out where the text is going to go, what figures are going to go with the text and so on. Fascinating. So this is another project. How did you come upon to decide to do this? Yeah, the Shabbat project grew um, directly out of the interfaith project, Birds of Longing. And I had reached the end of that project. And in addition to thinking what's next, which is what artists often do, like now, now what, you know, um, I felt exhausted really. And the situation in the Middle East wasn't improving at all. And I felt a need to go back to my own roots in Judaism and to the Kabbalat Shabbat service, which was very beautiful at my home synagogue in New York, Stephen Weiss Free Synagogue. And Cantor Daniel Singer um, does the music for that. And we did a soundscape for the project, um, which if uh, you go on my website, you'll be able to hear excerpts from the soundscape. It's, it's really lovely. Here's the circular. Is this a, something that is suspended from the ceiling? Yes, yes. And I've, I've done a few of those in different locations, but this to me was the veil. I use um, gauze there. It's medical gauze that I transform into something else, but um, it's a material that I used in the dance projects that I've done. And these are part of the Shabbat, of course. Mm -hmm. Right. And, and you'll see that from the different projects from South Africa to the Birds of Longing project to the Shabbat project, I use the tree form that's what we see here in Es Haim. And here's a detail of David. And this is, it's a more literal piece for me. Um, it's my drawing of a lyre, uh, a harp, handheld harp. Um, but I wanted to express the joy of music and Kabbalat Shabbat, the rhythm of it, and, and how much music is a part of the poetry that we've inherited, even if we don't always realize it. We do in the Kabbalat Shabbat service, but it's in many, many of our prayers. And it, it is so incredible that you can travel all over the world and you can walk into a temple and hear the same melody that you know from another temple. I mean, it connects us like beads, right. like your beads here, we're all connected. So we have here, this is a, a triptych. Right, the song, Shirai Shabbat, the so songs of Shabbat. And these were some of my favorite uh, texts and music. And I, I con conceived of this as sort of pages of music basically. It has that feel, that feel of it because it does have that linear quality of looking at a, a, a sheet of music. Right. And now we come to a, something altogether different. And so were you commissioned by this church to do these hangings? Yes, I was, I was commissioned by First Presbyterian Church in Chicago to do this project. Um, I didn't know how large it was going to be in the sense that we didn't know what the budget would be all at once. We sort of went from group to group to group. So it's 12 pieces. So it was divided up into three different uh, parts of the project basically. And uh, Fourth Presbyterian is a, a really huge congregation in downtown Chicago. I think it has 4,500 members and it's in a cathedral like building. It's stone and it's, they only had sort of artwork for the holidays for Christmas and Easter and Advent, but nothing for what they call ordinary time, which is the time when you're just there and you're just doing your thing, you know? And so these pieces all have texts from the Psalms and the prophets that are read during ordinary time. Uh, the pulpit paramount is uh, the piece hanging from the pulpit there has the text from Hine Mato, how good it is for us to be together. And the sanctuary is also used by a synagogue, uh, Chicago Sinai congregation uh, for high holiday services. So it's sort of nice for that too. And I was very fortunate. I, I was allowed to uh, choose the text for this. It was really wonderful. So and what- Green is the color for ordinary time in the liturgical 
calendar. So these pieces are prim primarily a light green, but with some lavender, rose, blue thrown in. Of course, lots of gold. And the light comes into the sanctuary and catches the gold in the pieces. I should say in terms of, for people interested in process, when I'm all through with a piece, before I put the beads on, I put a very thin gold wash over everything. So there are little tiny bits of gold in it. So when the light catches it, it really sparkles. And I think gives a sense of the sacred nature of, of these pieces. So stunning, especially to see the contrast between these uh, concrete blocks and then to see this beautiful textured, uh, almost like a gown that is dressing the wall. What Very a lovely, lovely way to think of it. Thank you. So what is a stole? A stole is just there, another word for a paramount, which is hanging from the pulpit. And this one is anchored by an enormous Bible, is holding it in place. And this is for each of the, you see three of the four liturgical seasons here. So the green one on the left is ordinary time. In the center, you have Christmas and Easter. And on the right is uh, Advent and Lent. So beautiful. And I use the same form as sort of wings, a modified wing form there. And it, of course, alludes to the prayer stoles that ministers and priests wear, as well as our own talit. That's what it looks like. So here's another one. This is a different. This is at First Presbyterian Church in uh, Durham. Not to say you haven't done something in a temple. <laughs> right. This is uh, my interpretation of a uh, Torah mantle. I think it's, it's well woven, unwoven in dupione silk, which I will never, ever do again. <laughs> the thread is so fine. It's just it's scary. Now, the reason we have this slide in here is both Lori and I wanted to show a, a moving image of dance that is uh, for which she has done the stage set, but the platform just won't allow for it. But if you want to say something about or share your thoughts on how your work melds with dance and music. Yeah, I was really fortunate when I lived in Chicago, there was a choreographer, Jan Urquhart, and she saw my work and she asked if I would collaborate with her dance company uh, to do a set design for them. And I, I went to dance rehearsals for a year and a half to understand what I wanted to do. And that was, that was a great experience for me. That was truly wonderful. And um, I decided I would make the set out of gauze. So because it's semi-transparent and you can see the figures through the gauze. And uh, for her dance and for this one, which was a later one with a different choreographer, Pauline Legrasse, um, the dancers move, the uh, strips are in groups of eight or 10 and run on parallel wires across the stage and they can move with them and be seen behind them and be in a processional with them and all sorts of things. The two choreographers use them in very different ways, but it was really one wonderful experiences, both of them. This one was in New York City, the other one was in Chicago. And um, we had dance interpretations of birds of longing. It was one thing that we had, Shelly and I had wanted to show that, but we couldn't. Um, a choreographer, uh, Carla de Sola, uh, is a liturgical choreographer, and she was moved to create dance interpretations of some of the pieces in Birds of Longing, and they were performed at Union Theological Seminary in New York City and also out in California. And that was a very special thing to work with as well. I would love to have seen those and maybe uh, maybe that'll happen someday. But here's some more process pieces, just some images. There's Lori up on the ladder. And we just wanted to give you a sense of the scale of some of this work and the detail work that she has to do. Do not fall off that ladder, Lori. Yeah, this I'm is sure. a scaffold actually. I'm standing on a platform. And get a ladder to go up on the platform. This isn't as high. When I did the pieces for Fourth Presbyterian Church, those pieces are almost 10 feet high. And I was on a really high scaffold 
you know, with my head nearly touching the ceiling in my studio. So uh, this is a, a piece for a private commission. It's called Mysterioso. And it was um, a very romantic text from La Traviata. Mm -hmm. Here's just some more uh, images. We wanted to show the scale of some of these pieces because sometimes that's hard to have it come through. I'm going to just move quickly because we have a lot of questions. So I wanna pose those to you, but the meditation project, is that a project that you are working on now? I just finished it. This was a project I did during the pandemic and inspired by the meditation circle that Rabbi Angela Buckdahl of Central Synagogue in New York City started this online meditation circle at the beginning of the pandemic. She met with us online every weekday for I think a year and a half. Now it's down to once a week, but it was amazing. She would give a teaching and we would be silent then after for about 20 minutes. And then she was also trained as a cantor and she would sing something at the end. And the pieces in the meditation project are interpretations of her teachings. Oh, so beautiful and peaceful. They communicate a real sense of mindfulness and presence. I, that was the intent. And of course, it was very solacing, this practice, especially being in New York City. The world just felt turned completely upside down. And um, it was a very wonderful gift she gave, gave and continues to give to all of us. So this is where you're going now, am I right? This is where I'm going now. Um, it's uh, welcoming the stranger. Um, it's very, been very much on my mind, especially with the theme of exile and birds of longing. Of uh, what, do, what did we do with all these people who were traversing the globe in these unimaginable circumstances and not even with a tent on their back? And um, so I'm trying to figure out a project that will deal with refugees and immigrants and how we can welcome the stranger. I did a commission for Central Presbyterian Church in Atlanta for their men's shelter, uh, welcoming the stranger. Um, or I was hungry and you fed me. It's a beautiful text. So this is a book that you did the illustrations for, and I wanted to put this up here to show that this book is available and, and Tamar's gonna put that in the chat. But tell me about this experience for you. Well, this was uh, Cantor Singer, who I think is on with us this evening, I hope. Um, he did the, very graciously and with, spent a lot of time, did the soundscape for the Shabbat project. So I wanted to do something for him and I created this unweaving for him, his name and his wife's names, Daniel and Leah, are on each side of the top of the piece. And this is Shirat Hayam, the song of the sea, Miriam's song at the sea. This was the text that Dan wanted. And then Dan um, is a wonderful composer and he put out his book, The Tapestry of Prayer. And he asked me if he could include a number of my um, unweavings in the book, which was a thrilling thing for me. And so there we are. That is a beautiful thing and it is available on Amazon. And what I'm going to do, and I, I think that, that this is a stunning piece in and of itself. I have a very strong desire to do a favor for you, Lori, so that I could get a special unweaving. <laughs> <laughs> okay. <laughs> But here we go. This is a big uh, sort of bit of a detail there. And I'm going to uh, pose some questions to you. We have quite a few. So I'm going to uh, start with and they, lots of them. So here's a question for you. The question is, so it's going back to your beginnings of uh, when you were uh, a lawyer. The question is, do you think the practice of law impacted your work? Is the pursuit of social justice a major part of your thinking? Oh, that's a real that's a really interesting question, actually. And I had actually not thought of it being connected, but it obviously is. When I was um, I practiced law for a few years um, and at a firm in New York City, and it was a very socially minded 
firm, a well-established firm, and we, a group of us, we were called Young Lawyers Against the War, went to Washington to observe a demonstration to make sure that people weren't arrested, basically. Um, so you could say that that, <laughs> that, had, that had some influence on some of the th themes that I think about. Um, that's, that's very interesting. I really hadn't thought about it in that way. Um, well, I, I do feel that there are, there are seeds that were planted there, and I think that they have grown, grown up with you. That's my, what I feel. I think that your pursuit and passion for social justice is definitely something that was born a long time ago. Question was, can you explain the concept of your weeping woman in the iconography? Ah, that was a weeping woman weeping over her dead. It was one of the first symbols I developed. And it was developed because of the story, the narrative I was trying to construct about what was happening in South Africa. And, uh, and it's and very then, powerful. And then it becomes a more generalized figure actually relating to, unfortunately to so many situations, but. but. Yeah, there's unfortunately many needs to have a, a, we a weeping woman. Yeah. Here's some process questions. What materials are you unweaving? And a oh. question. Yeah. yeah, what is this is 12 ounce cotton canvas. It's a one, it's a very thick canvas. It's not like a tarp or anything like that. It's artist canvas, but it's very heavyweight and it's very densely woven. So when you unweave it, um, depending on the length of the piece and what you're how you're unweaving it, if you're releasing the warp threads or your tight threads, so you're on I can either unweave those or unweave the weft threads, the long ones. And if I'm unweaving the weft threads, because the canvas is so uh, densely woven, it means that when you unweave them, it comes down like way below the initial uh, piece of fabric. And so you're enabled to do lots of wonderful things with that, with your form. So that all was a process. That was truly experimentation. I had no idea what would happen when I started unweaving and I just found all these different ways I could do it. The question, there's a question, is it hard to keep the whole piece from unraveling when you unweave it in the center? <laughs> no, not, not, not at all actually. Um, it, uh, it would take a lot to make it come apart. And I think it's because the fabric is so thick. But I'm also very careful when I'm unweaving it. I mark out the areas that are going to be unwoven with a quilting tape so that I don't go beyond where I intend to go. Um, and then the fabric, have, the fabric looks fragile, but it's actually pretty sturdy. Do you have many happy accidents where you <laughs> pulled something and you said, oh, I think it's going to become David's liar? <laughs> no. <laughs> yeah, no, I usually, um, in unweaving, I try to be very careful. The, the happy accident I had was something I was trying to paint and the color was really terrible and I threw the whole thing on the floor. This was early on. And then I looked at it, I thought, oh, well, I guess I could paint something over that and maybe that, and I did and it was fine. So, but uh, an unhappy accident was trying to work, make some form with paper mache, which molded while I was working with it. So yeah, that was an unhappy accident. I have a question about the gold wash. What's it made out of? It's called, uh, it's an acrylic paint called interference gold. Okay. And you can get it in um, either a fine form or a coarse form. And I usually use it coarse because the flecks of the gold, the solid flecks of gold are thicker there and they catch the light better. But I dilute it a fair amount. So uh, the last question I'm going to ask has to do with preservation. Is this an issue? And if so, how do you handle it? And I, I understand this, this is a, a woven piece. Could it become dusty? I mean, does this come up? Is this a conversation that you have? Oh, quite often. Um, it's actually the pieces don't attract dust that much, which is really interesting since everything else in my house does. Um, <laughs> But these don't, um, you take a feather duster. The, the main part that will attract dust is actually where they're suspended from a dowel. The top part will collect dust. So you just take a feather duster and that's it. 
And in, terms of, in terms of fading, people have asked about that. Um, <clears throat> nobody really knows about acrylic paint, how long that is actually going to last. But I can say that in our home here in Southwest Wisconsin, we have really bright sunlight. We've had our home here for about 30 years and the pieces that I have up have not faded at all. So they're pretty good. Well, thank you for answering all those questions and thank you for being such a good sport while I try and navigate the amazing work that you do with my lay, lay person's language. And your work is so, it's, it's uplifting and it's really uh, spiritually takes you to a new place. So I know that you have something you'd like to share, but I'll just tell our audience that Lori has something to share and then we have some housekeeping we wanna do. And uh, then we're gonna be able to take down the share screen and Lori can talk to you herself, but let's, let's carry on from here. Right, well, first I do wanna thank Shelley for being a wonderful interpreter of my work and for all of you for being here with us. And I wanted to offer you this poem by Denise Levertov, who's one of the poets whose work I include in Birds of Longing. It's, I have a small grain of hope, one small crystal that gleams clear colors out of transparency. I need more. I break off a fragment to send you. Please take this grain of a grain of hope so that mine won't shrink. Please share your fragment so that yours will grow. Only so by division will hope increase like a clump of viruses, which will cease to flower unless you distribute the clustered roots, unlikely source, clumsy and earth covered of grace. Very beautiful and so fitting, Lori, that you would end us, leave us with a, a poem because your work is in effect visual poetry. 